The EU Parliament President Roberto Metsola on tonight's programme says EU support for Ukraine as strong as ever and yet there's still more to do on Russia. And so here in Europe today I sat down with Roberto, President Roberto Metsola who is the President of the European Parliament. Now our meeting was before, our interview was before the news of the arrest of the Wall Street Journal uh, reporter came out. So I was unable to question on her, which is why you're not going to hear her talk about it. But on the bigger issue of Ukraine, on the wider issue, I should say, not bigger issue, on the wider issue of Ukraine, the underlying issue there, it's how the EU will continue to support uh, Ukraine. And here, President Mato Metsola made it clear there was no fatigue and the EU would do whatever was necessary. It ends when Russia gets out of Ukraine. It's the same thing we said immediately on the 24th of February last year when we all woke up to an invasion by a country into another. We have seen actually an escalation over the past um, a few days also with, with Russia placing, um, uh, uh, planning to place um, a nuclear armament in Belarus. And that has meant that we as a European Union Slow to start, although we got our act together, but weapons took, took long to get there. Tanks have finally started to arrive. As you said, jets have started to be given. We can still go further because the escalation is one we have to respond to. Okay, but the parliament, mm -hmm. being closer in a sense to the public, will start to feel that anxiety quicker than maybe the other institutions. And your MPs will start to say, hang on, where is this going? Do we want it to continue like this? Is it worth the price? I think, you know, the price for freedom can never be too high. And if you had asked me this one year ago, I would have thought that by today that anxiety would have hit in quicker, but it hasn't. No matter how hard they have been bombed every day, the Ukrainian resilience and spirit has shown us that the freedoms that we've all taken for granted are worth fighting for. So when you have a Hungary which won't allow weapons through its borders, it won't support in the same way. Yes, I know it hasn't blocked the various sanctions, but it hasn't gone wholeheartedly. And it's delaying, of course, Sweden uh, to NATO. Um, can you, as president of the parliament, put pressure there? Yeah, I mean, I, I sit around the table of the European Council uh, and my position, I have been mandated for, with most clarity, that unity is essential. And of course we can look and understand how difficult package by package of sanctions has been. But we've come so far that if we think of countries that were last year 100% reliant on Russian gas, and today we're in spring, doesn't look like this outside the windows, but we're at spring, we have survived the winter, our storages are still almost full, we have managed to uncouple ourselves and I think that we will not fall back into where we were before, into being rely, re relying on a very intimidating big neighbour to our east. But escalation is the fear and Ukraine, Russia says essentially it's NATO against Russia and the truth is that NATO is fighting this war without fighting this war. I would say that Russia or Putin thought he could take Kiev at the time within five days. I think he underestimated, perhaps the world underestimated the resilience of Ukraine. We tend to forget, or sometimes we exclude it from our narrative, that this is about one country that has invaded another. Putin didn't stop in 08, he didn't stop in Crimea, he doesn't look like he's stopping now. What should our response be? Let Ukraine alone or actually help logistically, militarily, financially? Should it do more? I would be the first one to say, absolutely. Are our defense capabilities, should have they been, been better? Absolutely. Should we create a security and defense union? Absolutely. Not in competition with NATO, in complementarity with NATO. But there are countries to our east, who have been telling us for years, right. this is going to happen. Look at Moldova. Look at what happened in Belarus. Why are there no more sanctions to, on Belarusian regime? Why haven't we not helped Moldova more? 
we should have done that earlier. And I think that if we learn something, is that looking at the transatlantic alliance, never before, at least in my lifetime, more important than it is now. As the European Union grapples with a response to the United States' Inflation Reduction Act, the President of the EU Parliament says green subsidies are all fair and good, but wants to avoid a race to the bottom. However, Europe must respond. And as she told me, the pressure is now ratcheting up to react to the IRA before the US takes the lion's share of business. I asked President Roberto Mazzola what the EU is actually doing to tackle the inflation crisis. Our economy is based on small and medium-sized enterprises. How are we going to help them? And there, together with the rise of interest rates, in order to curb inflation, we're going to have to help them sector by sector, country by country. You've just said, we're going to have to help them. Now, does that mean at national government level? Does that mean at European level? Because the central European level has moved into areas that it was not in before. I'm thinking, of course, of mutualization of debt in some cases. Mm -hmm. What does that mean, helping? Does that mean uh, picking and choosing sectors mm -hmm. for central help? Yeah, this is actually quite, uh, quite a, a dominant discussion, in fact, when you see prime ministers next to each other arguing, listen, I need help here, or I need help here. The Recover and Resilience Facility, which we um, voted on in this House together with the Commission and the Council, was aimed at what we call the digital and green transition for all economies, irrespective of which country, to become, I would say, more equal, to create a more level playing field, not to make them the same, but if you look at the investment by certain countries in, in sectors, that should be encouraged. If we look at some countries that still require a lot of help, let's bring them up to where the countries that have been invested in the past could go. So let's talk about investment in renewables. Let's talk about sectors where we are very competitive as European Union. But also let's talk about those sectors that are concerned about the emergence of China, the Inflation Reduction Act. The IRA is a really good example of how a federal system works with a central core that comes in with a policy that everybody seems to say, gosh, this is rather good. This is exactly what's needed. Europe comes along with its net zero this and it's this policy that and a sort of a half-hearted attempt because it's all by consensus. And everybody agrees, yes, the Commission's come up with something, but it's not quite the IRA. You're saying that, not me. But what I will tell you it's not, is that... It's, it's not. I mean, more needs to be done on the European side. No, no, I, I, I'm, I think the, the way, first of all, our transatlantic alliance has not been this good since the fall of the wall. I can say this. Uh, and I say this because uh, when we look at the IRA being a fundamentally, you know, piece of legislation that aims to make the U.S. greener, aims to make the U.S. competitive, aims to make the U.S. more protective of its sectors, how do we react? Do we go... Fortress Europe don't touch our products? Do we go, let's continue to rely on unreliable partners for importation of critical um, raw materials and rare earths? Or do we say, let's see where we're competitive, let's make an agreement with the United States, which we are on track in terms of what was signed already. When we look at the Net Zero Industry Act, it's not by consensus, it's by proper legislative process inside this house, in order to look at where we can, let's not say protect, but help our industry survive. Right, but I'm going to ask the question again. The view in Europe is, or from those I've business leaders I've spoken to, yes, something has been done, but the, Europe has not yet come up with the A killer app like the IRA. Okay, I take that, uh, and I put it on ourselves in order for us to make sure that we we um, alleviate the impact that we will have without going down a protectionist subsidy road to the bottom race. And I think that's where the conversation we need to have with our industry leaders. So, finally, uh, how much is it for an MEP? I mean, the Qatar and the... <laughs> for an MEP. No, you, 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 I, I'm being facetious here on a very I'm... serious issue. Uh, first of all, do you believe Qatar did bribe? 
and secondly, how are you going to prevent it? Because this is the sort of thing that if you do not show teeth, you're in, you may as well turn the yeah. lights off. I can tell you that this has been the hardest thing that I've had to deal with. Uh, you know, the instinct could have been actually criminal corruption is as old as politics. There will always be somebody who's willing to pay and always be someone who's willing to take payment for anything, right? This is life. But I took a decision on that day that for the protection of this institution, for the integrity of the European Union, keeping in mind the fact that these are allegations, presumption of innocence, etc., we cannot allow a house like this to be as vulnerable. Now, does that mean close it up? Of course not. We pride ourselves on our openness. But that has meant that we put in, and we're rolling them out month by month, 15 immediate measures, a little bit more long-term, some coming after. We've put in a revolving door for MEPs. We've made sure that we keep tabs on who comes in and comes out, declaration of meetings, who are you talking to, preserving your mandate as a freely elected member of the European Parliament, but at the end of the day, making sure that if the alarm bells, and I, I take this as my responsibility, did not ring early enough, Next time, I hope they will. Were you shocked when it happened? I was shocked. It was like someone punched me in the gut. Really? Winded, I would say, yeah. Influential women says we should remember leaders who stepped down for what they did, not for their decision to bow out. When I was with the President of the European Parliament, she gave me her take on the resignations of Nicola Sturgeon and Jacinda Ardern. I sat down with President Roberto Mazzola after she gave me a grand tour of the European Parliament. When you see President of the European Parliament, do you sort of think, eh, that's me? In, it, actually, in France, it's La Présidente, so, you know, it depends on the title. It, it's, yeah, it takes a bit of getting used to. Uh, no, I just walk past it. So what are you voting on? All of this. So, big legislative, so these are very normal stuff we have every voting, but this one, European Europe Skills, is a report. This general product safety regulation, legislative, Equal pay for equal work between men and women, that's the bell sounding. Big legislation, we've been waiting for it for years. So I preside the votes, which means that uh, I open the votes, some of them are by show of hands, uh, some Do of them are... you have a casting there. in the event of...? In the bureau, so with the board of vice presidents, yeah, yeah there is a casting. But Stop. it's rare, but it actually happens, you know, yeah. that you have an equal amount, exact equal amount. We have a service uh, in this house that, that focuses on voting and plenary. It's sometimes very complicated, sometimes very long, um, but uh, the majorities Do you are want sometimes... just bang everybody's heads together and say, oh, for God's sake, Good morning. just get on with it? Um, quite a lot, but I guess that's normal, no? Uh, you know, you'll see there are 700 uh, and uh, five members of the European Parliament. You can see where everybody's sitting, so you know... So we have a hemicycle here, which is... Uh, you know, a very nice one, cosy, uh, you can uh, really, hear, and you can hear everything, you can hear insults, comments, compliments, everything. And Good it's morning. all done by grouping, of course, of it's all political done by grouping. grouping, the exactly. left, the, left to the, the right. right. Yeah, and then, uh, so the majorities are sometimes right down the middle. Uh, we won't see today, Where but would you put yourself? Well, I come from this political group, and I would put myself right exactly oh, in the middle. Oh, along the wishy-washy centre. No, nothing wishy-washy about that. European. Wow. So this is a debate that's happening before, so we have quite a lot. It's at the moment rule of law, big thing. At the mo if you hear someone Spanish, it's, you know, it's, it's talking about, about uh, Spain. Is the parliament being tough enough in Hungary? We have been extremely um, tough. Uh, this has been uh, a parliament that has long looked for uh, rule of law. Uh, uh, conditions being met by all member states, so all countries. Uh, and we asked for that for many years. Uh, and that's thanks to this room where we look at each member state and say, on this, you need to improve. And we take credit for the fact that improvements have been made. A lot needs to be done with many countries. This is the discussion that's happening now. And on everything, we, on, 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 with every single country, we negotiate, we discuss, and we go ahead. With a young family 
and a war and a crisis of c corruption or whatever. How do you do it? I mean, that's what people are saying. Either you are superwoman or you are mad <laughs> or you have extremely good... A bit good, of both, yeah. Or you have extremely good help at home. A little bit of everything. First, perhaps you could ask any man uh, or father or any parent sitting opposite you the same question. I've always said that because, you know, I remember as a young candidate, then I was young, you know, with little boys, I had the two boys, age two and one. The single question people would ask me, oh, those poor boys, and my answer would be, are you asking my husband the same thing? <laughs> Nobody did. Nobody did. So how do we do it? It takes loads of organization, grandparents, I can say this, <laughs> Uh, and a schedule that is practically inflexible, even though sometimes it has to become flexible. So when you heard the Prime Minister of New Zealand and then the First Minister Scotland. of Scotland, do you admire what they've done? And as you've still got fuel in the tank, do you secretly think, what's going to happen to me when I get too empty? I think everybody should ask themselves that question, oh. and it requires, you know, balance of everything and making sure that you give yourself the time that, uh, for example, I take in maybe 12 minutes of the day I have for myself to, to listen to audio books. I listen to political biographies. That's my, as boring as it sounds, that's what I love to, uh, to, to read. I will miss Jacinda. You know, I met her a few months ago and I thought she's one of the most amazing women I've ever met. And I then thought that she could, you know, So were you disappointed? Were you a little bit inside that she had been proven to be human? You know what I was disappointed about? The reaction to her saying that. that that's what they focused on, rather than on the fact that she had twice been such a successfully elected prime minister, that she had managed a terror attack so, with so difficulty, but so skillfully, with such humanity. I wanted, and I want us to focus on her legacy, rather than on what she said on the last meeting when she said, I'm out. And that's, that's what I think we should do more of when we look at politics and politicians, or anyone really, who says, this was my chapter, now it's the end of it. You've got, a long, you've got a long way to go. I don't know how many chapters left, but uh, you know, in politics you always you know, expect the unexpected and be ready for anything. It could be anything.